there you go. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome officially to this um, AAAPC webinar with Professor Felicity Goodyear-Smith. Um, on behalf of AAAPC, I'd like to first thank Felicity for accepting to present to us today. We're very, very um, excited. Um, I think it's, um, it's always a great opportunity to hear from, um, you know, people with such um, you know, inspiring journeys in primary health care research. And um, so I'd like to first introduce um, Felicity to you. So um, Felicity Goodyear-Smith has had an amazing um, career and um, she's going to talk to us today about how um, she sort of inadvertently morphed into an academic. So I can't wait to hear you um, talk about this, Felicity. But Felicity is professor and good fellow, postgraduate chair in the Department of General Practice and Primary Healthcare, Faculty of Medical and Health Science at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, she was head of department from 2013 to 2019. She's a general practitioner and also founding editor of the Journal for Primary Healthcare. Um, she's been, um, you know, involved in a range of projects, um, varied projects in primary care research uh, over the past um, two decades, um, locally, but also internationally. So we're very excited to um, welcome you, um, Felicity. I will unmute you. Um, and so just to let everyone know that Felicity will be um, um, first talking to us without PowerPoint support, and then she will introduce the PowerPoint at some, at some point during the talk. So just a reminder, Felicity, to please share your screen at that, at that point in time. Uh, so Felicity, now to you. Oh, well, kia ora, everybody. And, um, and thank you very much, Lolly, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, and so what I'm going to talk about is um, how I stumbled into primary care academia uh, uh, nearly 20 years ago now. Um, yeah, so mine isn't a sort of normal route, but there may be um, uh, things that you can, uh, you can learn that might actually help you along the way. Um, so really, um, when I was a very young child, I was a really avid reader uh, and I wanted to be a writer. But then I changed my mind when I was aged eight and decided I wanted to be a doctor. And I, uh, I stayed with that decision uh, from then on. So uh, when I left high school uh, in 1971, I entered the uh, Auckland Medical School, which was a pretty new school in those days. Um, I was in the fourth intake. Uh, the, I guess the most memorable experience I had in those six years uh, was when I did an elective um, for three months in Hokianga, which which is in remote, remote Northland. Uh, and um, there was a rural hospital there with nine little clinics scattered um, around the harbour. Um, the, um, it was just me and the superintendent uh, who, after I'd been there two weeks, got, got meningitis and I had to send him off to the base hospital. So I was the acting superintendent for three weeks, which was pretty daunting, but also incredibly valuable. Um, and I was supported by some wonderful nurses and I used to ring the superintendent from the base hospital every evening uh, and, uh, and check in. Um, and the very best house call I ever did was when I was up there. And I, uh, I did a clinic in a little uh, seaside uh, uh, coastal village called Mitty Mitty, and they asked me to come and see one of their relatives. So I went back uh, along this dirt road um, to, to, to Mitty Mitty for the weekend, and I stayed with the family, and then we went on horseback up the beach and into the forest where this young man lived with his family. And uh, he had uh, type one diabetes um, and, uh, and, and really needed medical care. And so I managed to persuade him to come into the hospital the next week and get himself sorted. And then we rode back on horseback and collected muscles on the route, stayed with the family again and, uh, uh, and uh, went back to Ramani uh, Sunday evening. So it was like a whole weekend to do a house call, but it was just such an amazing experience. And after I graduated then, um, I became a house officer in the Whangarei uh, Base Hospital. And again, that was a incredibly valuable experience for me uh, because um, uh, we didn't have registrars. It was just the house officers and, and, uh, and the consultants. And so we got to do everything. Um, and we really learned an awful lot of medicine and surgery and also obstetrics. Uh, but really... Um, after that, I wanted to travel. Um, particularly, I wanted to go to the UK because um, my, my parents had immigrated from there after the war. Uh, and so while I was a house surgeon up there, I wrote uh, to every, uh, sh every shipping company uh, in the Yellow Pages. 
and I would get a lot of, I, I signed my letters, Dr. F.A. Goodyear Smith, and a lot of the replies would come back, Dear Sir. Now, I didn't actually get to work my passage, but I did get offered uh, a two-month cruise through the Far East. And when the agent actually spoke to me, he got a bit of a shock when he discovered that uh, uh, I wasn't going to be able to fit the uniform they had for me, uh, and it really wasn't suitable for a woman. But, uh, but I did the cruise. It was, uh, um, it was a lot of fun, although uh, it certainly put me off cruises. A lot of it was really boring. Uh, but basically came back, and then I flew to San Francisco, and I bought an old car, and I had six months' amazing time traveling through the U.S. and Canada, uh, sleeping in the car, and uh, but mostly hiking in all the national parks, which I couldn't believe how incredible and varied they were uh, compared to, to New Zealand, um, particularly the wildlife. So I, eventually I got to New York and uh, I took a, a cheap flight, which is called a Freddie Laker flight, to London. Once I got to London, um, I did a number of hospital locums. And in those days, New Zealand graduates were well sought after, so I had no trouble getting work. And I got to work at a, a, a number of the, um, the teaching hospitals in London. Uh, but my very first GP locum was in a valley in South Wales, where I had uh, four months working as a GP there. Uh, a very impoverished community and, uh, uh, and, and incredibly, I learned a lot working there. And there, in the next village, there was an elderly GP who, and I shared a uh, call with him. So I used to spend quite a bit of time with him and his wife uh, talking and he was really inspiring. Um, and he taught me, one of the things he taught me was that those who need the care the most uh, are those who get it the least. And his name was Julian Tudor Hart. But it was only years and years later that I discovered that actually he was really famous and that he had um, published uh, the um, inverse care law, uh, which he was teaching me uh, uh, about in sort of very practical terms. So he was really, um, he was really an inspiration for me to, to go into general practice. And um, on the basis of that, I wrote to several uh, countries, and um, uh, including the Ministry of Health in Jamaica, and I got offered a two-year contract in Jamaica. So uh, I, I went to Kingston, and my first six months, I did obstetrics uh, in downtown Kingston in a hospital called the Victoria Jubilee Lying In Hospital. And then I did another 18 months uh, running a primary healthcare centre that was just out of uh, Kingston. And I had a, it had a catchment population of about 18,000. Uh, and I was the only doctor, but I had um, a large number of really uh, excellent auxiliary staff. Uh, and we sort of trained, trained up to work together. Um, I used to go down to the docks and actually be able to beg medications uh, as they came in um, uh, to, to the ministry and uh, take them back and we'd bottle them up uh, and, um, and I'd write prescriptions uh, and then I'd go and dispense them. Uh, every 20 prescriptions, I'd then dispense them. And so I had staff sort of putting on labels and the most valuable thing with the bottles. So we actually had to patients, had to insist that the patients brought the bottles back. So that was, um, that was an amazing time. And I did my very first uh, research there, which was really just a clinical audit of my practice. Uh, and it was uh, about the morbidity in primary health care in a rural Jamaican community. Um, unfortunately, though, I never published it. I, I did send it to one journal and got rejected. And then my busy clinical life took over and I never, um, uh, I never followed that up. Um, these days, I would never let um, a piece of research go unpublished. And then I came back to New Zealand and uh, I became a full-time GP at an inner city uh, part of Auckland called Freeman's Bay. And this again was a really valuable clinical experience. Um, I, it was a fascinating area. It was, had been a slum of Auckland. Uh, it had a whole mixture of, uh, of people. Uh, we had uh, Maori and Pacific, we had migrants, uh, particularly those from the Philippines. Uh, I had um, I looked after all the prostitutes up in K Road, uh, a lot of halfway houses, city mission, um, and um, and also um, I had a large gay population, both men and women, uh, and I uh, actually managed. Uh, sadly, I diagnosed the first case of HIV 
uh, uh, during that time in New Zealand. And then I had uh, several patients die of AIDS in those first couple of years when the epidemic first hit. Uh, we also had there, um, there were, um, the area was just becoming gentrified. So we had young families doing up villas. We had theatre people, dance people, artists, um, uh, restaurants being set up in uh, Ponsonby Road. It's, it's now a very, very trendy, expensive area, of course. Uh, but it was, a, uh, it was a great place to be a GP. Um, and I also did a lot of deliveries at that time. Um, so I did that for a few years. Um, eventually, I, I, I was married and I had two stepsons uh, and, uh, who were growing up. And then um, my husband and I had a daughter who was born in 1994. So I'd, I sold my practice because I wanted um, holidays um, off for us to spend time and travel together with our daughter. Uh, and uh, so I was just doing some locums. Uh, and about that time, uh, the University of Otago advertised a postgraduate course called the Philosophy of General Practice. Now, this just uh, interested me, uh, the title of it interested me, so I enrolled uh, for the course. And before I knew what I was doing, I was enrolled for the Masters. So I completed the Masters uh, and did my thesis uh, and got the degree in 1998. Uh, and then in 2000, um, I started to do some contract research for the Department of General Practice in Auckland. So um, initially it was, it was doing systematic reviews for accident compensation, but there were also um, several academics in the department who had actually uh, got grants and done some research, but they still hadn't analysed all their data and they hadn't actually published papers. So they um, used the, the, the remains of their grant to employ me to finish off the research and to publish the papers. Um, and so unplanned, um, I started to do a lot of writing and uh, I morphed into that writer that I had aspired to be when I was really little. Uh, and, uh, and I got a number of publications quite fast. Uh, I hadn't realised actually that publications are the currency uh, of, of academia. It was just something I enjoyed doing, but uh, more recently I realised that that's actually um, one of the things that you, you do need to do if you want to grow as an academic. Uh, I, so I, I then started to be a co-investigator on other people's grants and eventually I, did, I put in my own uh, applications and became a, a, a principal investigator on grants. And as, um, as Lonnie mentioned, um, uh, I was also a, the founding editor of the Journal of Primary Healthcare. How this came about was that our college, Royal New Zealand College of GPs, had a, um, um, a, a journal called the, the New Zealand Family Physician. And it, it had been going 35 years, but it had never actually been midline listed. And the editor was retiring and I was asked if I would be the editor. And I said no, but I would actually consider retiring the journal and founding a new one. And so they let me, and so I founded the Journal of Primary Health Care. Uh, and I, um, I asked all my primary care colleagues uh, in New Zealand to, su to, to support me and to, to, uh, uh, to take it on faith. And so they all sent me really good publications uh, and we really launched the journal. And we got Medline listing in 12 months after we had launched it. So that, 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 was, um, that was a great, um, it was a great love of mine being the, uh, being the editor. It was a lot of work. It was all manual. I was doing it on an Excel spreadsheet. I, I didn't have a management system. Uh, but um, but I, it really also helped, of course, connect me to the primary care community because, you know, I, I made connections with lots and lots of people who submitted, me, uh, who submitted their work to me. And also, as Lowley said, um, in 2010, I was awarded a personal and a good fellow uh, postgraduate chair. And this meant that now I was tenured and I actually had uh, an appointment with the university. So um, after all those years of uh, soft money, I became a fully fledged academic. Um, at that point, I didn't have a PhD, although because I'd done so much research, I had actually been supervising PhD students for some time, and I decided it was probably time I got one, particularly because I quite like the, um, the sort of uh, uh, floppy bonnet rather than the uh, black mortarboard. 
and anyway, so I decided rather than do a PhD, I do an MD, a Doctor of Medicine. Uh, and what, what that involves is taking a body of research you've already done and then writing a cogent thesis around it. So I enrolled for a, an MD in 2011 and uh, was awarded it in uh, 2000, end of 2012. So now I can say I'm truly a, uh, have a doctoral degree. Uh, the following year, 2013, um, I was suddenly asked to be head of department and I had never anticipated this. Um, a lot of that role involves overseeing the undergraduate medical program about which I knew absolutely nothing and I'd never taught on it. Uh, so it was a huge learning curve. Uh, and, um, uh, and for the last six years, I've been um, very involved in um, and overseeing that medical program uh, and running and also all the other things involved with um, being a head of department, as I'm sure those of you who are head of departments know very well. Uh, and so that I, I did six years and I stood down in January this year. Uh, and uh, now I'm hoping to be able to focus more on my research, which did have to take uh, a second place while I was, um, while I was head of department. Uh, there might be something uh, that about uh, another role that I have that, that many of you may not know is that I'm, I'm also a forensic <coughs> physician. And this started when I was in Jamaica and I used to be a police doctor and one of my roles there was actually conducting autopsies. Uh, 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 often the determining the cause of death in Jamaica was quite, uh, quite easy because um, really what you would see is an entry and an exit point of a bullet and, and look at what tissues that it had uh, the bullet had traveled through in between uh, so um, and I actually had some very good um, uh, autopsy technicians who would uh, do a lot of the actual hard um, dissection work but um, once I was in Freeman's Bay I also became a police doctor uh, and I had a special expertise in sexual assault and I was on the police roster for many years uh, during that time I also um, did uh, locums uh, in, in our two prisons in Auckland uh, that's uh, Mount Eden and Paramaremo. So I, um, uh, I actually also experienced um, uh, forensic uh, medicine from that, that aspect as well. And in um, 2008, uh, I, um, I became a member of the Faculty of Forensic and Legal uh, Medicine, which is um, a faculty of the Royal College of Physicians in the UK. And uh, in 2014, I then became a fellow of that, uh, of that college. So I'm going to I'm going to share my slides now. Bear with me. I think that should be okay. Um, so I'm just uh, that all good. Um, so I've just I've I've, um, I've published uh, several books um, on on uh, forensic medicine. Um, these these two books are actually uh, books that I um, that I authored. So I, I, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with the technology here. Um, there we go. Um, and I've also published uh, several book chapters. And I have, um, I have over 35 papers uh, in peer-reviewed journals that relate to various aspects of, of forensic science. So that's just a little bit about my, my journey and um, my background um, and how I sort of became, uh, uh, sort of morphed into an epidemic really without ever planning it. And now I'm just going to share um, a little bit with you about some of my more recent research. Um, and, and much of the research I'm doing these days involves co-design. That's um, involving participants in the design and, and, and conducting a study. So I'm going to show you three different projects that all involve co-design in different ways. So the first one started in 2016 when I had the opportunity to invite a, a New Zealand family doctor and her patient to the patient and clinician engagement uh, workshop or called PACE at the North American Primary Care Research Group conference, which was held in Colorado Springs in the States. And the aim of PACE is to have patient and clinician uh, peers to learn about and engage in primary care research. And patients uh, generate the research questions that are relevant to their own communities. 
So I chose um, a GP called Tana Fishman, who came from South Auckland, and she invited her patient, Rose Lamont, a Samoan teacher. Uh, prior to this, the only uh, clinician patient pairs at PACE had been Canadians or, um, uh, or, or, or Americans. So we were, you know, we, we were extending their, um, their outreach quite a lot by coming from New Zealand. And um, Tana says that when she, you know, because I just said, I want you to come to this conference and I want you to bring a patient. And she said she felt very uncomfortable traveling to the airport um, on the start of the trip. Um, because Ray, Rose was her patient, but she wasn't a friend of hers. And she was worried about how she'd maintain the professional boundaries. Um, and she was also aware of the potential power imbalance. Um, and, and she wanted to ensure that there was an equal partnership between them. And Rose said she also really felt nervous going to the airport. She worried that she knew nothing at all about medical things, and, but she was really excited to be going. But when they traveled together, um, Tanner and Rose um, shared their meals, uh, their exercise opportunities, tourist attractions, um, uh, group discussions, uh, they shared their costs and their personal lives. And if Tanner had actually maintained her professional distance, then Rose would not have been comfortable and the experience would not have been anywhere near as valuable. And it was because Rose felt that she could ask questions about, from Tanner whenever she didn't understand anything. Um, uh, 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 and given her Samoan culture, it's not okay to ask questions of someone who is above you in rank and um, uh, and an authority. Uh, and so um, in a professional setting, uh, Pacific people find it very difficult to, to ask questions. And so the story of their, um, their traveling together has been published in this little paper uh, in the British Journal of General Practice called um, Traveling Companions. So when um, Tanner and, uh, and Rose were quite inspired, and when they came back to New Zealand, um, Rose recruited a group of Pacific people from the community and she formed the Pacific People's Health Advisory Group. And this group started to meet and explore research questions that they'd like to have answered for their people. This is a, a picture of some of the members of the group and this is uh, in Tanner in the, um, in the black and white. In New Zealand, um, family practices or belong to a primary health organisation network or a PHO. Uh, and the Pacific practices in South Auckland mostly belong to one, and it's called the Alliance Health Plus. And this PHO has generously provided support to the community advisory group. And this includes being able to uh, meet at their, uh, have a venue to meet at their uh, offices. They provide a meal there and a stipend for the members who, who attend the meetings. And um, subsequently, Tana um, has now uh, become the clinical director uh, for the PHO. I then, um, if they started to, the group started to ask questions, uh, but they really didn't progress any further than that. Um, and so then I approached a Tongan researcher uh, from Pacific Health uh, in my school, uh, Malakai Ofanoa, and he, so he joined our project. And so last year, Malachi and I ran a workshop to the community group to train them in basic uh, research methodology and in particularly Pacific methodologies. So we talked about different research methods, quantitative versus qualitative, um, and, and some basic information about how to ask, ask research questions. Um, and so one of the Pacific research frameworks we discussed is something called Fa'afale Tui. Uh, and this has an emphasis on collectiveness, on working together, and it fits really well with a co-design model. Um, and it, it also suits a mixed methods approach. Um, so the Fa'afale Tui says that um, this, to solve a problem, you, have three, you need three perspectives and you have to have all of them uh, to get action. So the first perspective is the view from the top of the mountain. And this is from where you can see the whole landscape. Uh, and this brings a distance lens to the problem, and you can see the big picture. This may be a quantitative approach, uh, looking at na national or regional statistics, for example. And the second perspective is the view from the top of the tree. 
And people from the top of a tree have a middle distance lens to the issue. And this may mean that they're collecting and analyzing data that comes from their particular community or population. And lastly, there's the perspective of the person in the canoe fishing. So the people closest to the school of fish are those who are most affected by the problem. They know the small details. However, they, they don't necessarily have the broader view that allows them to account for the issues that are contributing to the problem. So, but we do need to hear their voices and we need to give them the opportunity to tell their stories. And this fits really well with qualitative uh, methodology. So after that, our next step um, was to establish a Pacific Practice-Based Research Network, or PBRN, uh, of the general practices that serve the Pacific community of South Auckland. So we asked, asked each practice to um, have a designated research officer, uh, and sometimes this is a GP in the practice, sometimes it's a nurse, uh, sometimes it's the manager. Um, and these, th these uh, people are the research champions for their practice. And so then we had another workshop where we combined the, uh, the, the advisory group and the uh, research champions from the practices and looked at, um, uh, again, how to generate questions and, um, and had much more of a good exercise on generating questions that, that for where we thought there would be true knowledge gaps and that were doable and that where the answer might truly make a difference to uh, people in their community. Um, and then we collated all those questions, so we got people to send them in, uh, and we found, um, we had a look at them, and we found that there was one question that both the advisory group and the, um, uh, and the research had come from both, both, both the PBRN and the advisory group, uh, and we decided that was the one to start with. And, and this question um, is, to prevent gout and Pacific people are incredibly prevalent uh, gout is incredibly prevalent in Pacific people uh, and they're also the uh, people least likely to take your urate lowering therapy to prevent gout flares so it is a, a particularly important problem uh, for this community so this year we've had a master's student who's undertaken a systematic review of interventions uh, to improve gout management. And he also um, has done a stock take um, of all the gout programs that have been introduced in New Zealand. Uh, so these include um, educational campaigns, um, uh, nurse-led programs and pharmacy-led initiatives. Uh, and, and some of these programs um, uh, are happening in communities but aren't necessarily written up. So we're looking at all the components uh, uh, of these programs. Um, and we've also had an honours student who's conducted a quantitative study looking at national, regional and uh, our PBRN uh, prevalence data uh, for gout in both Pacific, well, in Pacific Maori and non-Maori, non-Pacific populations. Um, and we've also looked in the, in, within the, the, the people with gout, the proportion that have had their U8 uh, levels measured, uh, who've had um, medication, uh, preventative medication prescribed, and also those who've had the medication dispensed, because sometimes there's also a gap between getting a prescription and actually getting it dispensed. Uh, and we're hoping to have a PhD, a Pacific PhD student next year to work with patients, with them without gout, with the community group and with the PBRN to look at developing and then evaluating a specific intervention. Um, we're also planning a, a meeting next year to increase our capacity by uh, connecting uh, other Pacific researchers in Auckland with our community group and with our um, PBRN and with other questions that they want answered um, and seeing if we can grow this project. So that's the first one. Oh yes, we, we, we've, we're, we're, um, I'm a firm believer in publishing wherever possible, as you've probably gathered by now. Uh, and so we currently have a paper in press in the Annals of Family Medicine, which describes that whole research process I've just told you about. And we have another two under review. Um, one is on the paradigm of Fa'afale Tui and how it fits with the mixed method research approach. Um, and we also have um, a systematic review on the, uh, on the um, 
gout interventions under review as well. So this, the second project I'm particularly interested in involving co-design um, is, is with uh, Youth Chat. So Youth Chat's an electronic screening tool for 12 mental health and lifestyle issues in young people. And Chat actually stands for Case Finding and Help Assessment Tool. And when a young people has a positive response on the tool, um, they're then asked if this is an issue with which they'd like help. So that's the H, the help. Uh, um, once they've done this, it's like a waiting room tool generally. The results are immediately available as a summary report to, to their clinician. Um, and so the whole idea of the tool really is to facilitate a conversation with their doctor or nurse. Uh, and then we have a stepped care intervention package, which is customized for that clinic as provided to, to assist the clinician in actually taking the next steps. So the, um, the, the, the modules that we screen for, uh, they cover substance misuse, um, issues with gambling and gaming, anxiety and depression, stresses, uh, abuse and difficulty uh, controlling anger, sexual health issues, eating and conduct disorders, and physical inactivity. And I have a PhD student who's uh, previously been a school nurse, uh, and we've also employed um, on the project a Maori school nurse from Northland. Um, Rhiannon uh, uh, Martell is my PhD student and Tracy Weehongi uh, from, from Northland. And they're using a, a, a bicultural approach, um, working with local Maori to, as an implementation science of rolling out youth chat in Northland. And so they're using a blend of Maori and European culture, uh, cultures to guide the research. Uh, and including, including Maori rituals and protocols, and it's led by our local collaborators. Um, and this ensures that the young people and the clinical, clinical staff actually feel ownership of this tool and its implementation. So there's several Kaupapa Maori principles which under, underpin this um, co-design approach. Uh, and the first is about relationship building. And so we have uh, forums and meetings called hui, and these, are, these include Maori greetings and introductions, songs or waiata and food. Um, and so this getting to know and work with each other in these ways um, in, engenders trust and it enhances the creativity through sharing our different cultural uh, perspectives. And then the principle of um, tino rangatira tanga uh, or self-determination uh, with the co-design approach of doing research with people, not on people. And um, the important principles for Maori uh, 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 relation to uh, self-determination include respecting people's mana, um, using the Maori language, uh, te reo, and learning through shared experiences. And when we go up there, um, local Maori host and look after our Pākehā research members um, uh, creating a safe space for us all to work and, and uh, speak together. And uh, all our participants are acknowledged for their time through koha or gift. So we've developed a Maori version of Youth Chat at their request. Uh, this is for the local Kura or Maori Immersion School. So this is a, a school where everything is conducted in Tureo in Maori. Uh, and we, the logo, um, uh, what, the logo was developed by a competition with uh, Kura students. And so the winning um, logo we then had uh, professionally drawn. So you can see the logo at the top there. Uh, and then we also had Youth Chat professionally translated into Maori. And then we workshopped with the Kura students to convert it into the, their local dialect. And, and then we had it back translated just to make sure that it was accurate. And then we added um, uh, 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 text to voice, um, and there's no uh, no online version of uh, a text to voice in Maori. So we had um, one of our local collaborators actually um, uh, recorded uh, all the text herself, and so it, it also can speak into Rayo. And lastly, we have an introduction um, uh, to to the uh, tool at the beginning, and in this case, we had several of the uh, the students at the Kura um, actually introduced it in, uh, in Maori. 
So these processes have given the end user, so in this case it's the Kura staff and the students, ownership of the tool, and the young people are now champions of its use. So that's the, that, that's, that's the second one. The third one's quite different. The third one is one of my international studies. Um, uh, but again, it, it, it looks at using end users um, involved in a process. Um, and this was a Wonka project um, I led in response to an RFP that came from Ariadne Labs uh, with funding from the Gates Foundation. And the aim of the study was to identify research gaps around improving primary health care in low and middle income countries. Um, and we won, um, there were four grants on offer and we won two of them. So we were looking at um, the organisation of primary health care and the financing of primary health care. And because we had two grants, um, we, we ran both projects in parallel. But I had um, a great team of co-investigators from around the world. Um, and, um, and together we had a large number of international networks that we could draw on. And uh, we also had um, a, a number of collaborators and advisors from low and middle income countries, some of them pictured here. So um, how we did this was um, the, the, the other actual um, uh, winners of the bids who were doing, working on two other different topics um, actually did the literature reviews and then just had a small stakeholder um, uh, sort of advisory group to say, uh, are we right? Whereas we, we started the other way around uh, and we wanted to start with the people on the ground. So through our networks, we recruited um, a panel and we had 140 uh, primary care practitioners. They were mostly family doctors. We, we, we would have liked to have had nurses. Um, we got a few, but, um, but the timing was incredibly tight for this project and we didn't have time for it to get to the International Nursing Council uh, and, and get back to their members. And we also had a number of academics and the uh, panel uh, came from 50 low and middle income countries um, throughout the world. And then we used an online tool um, and um, we asked our panel to generate questions that they, th they thought were important and which they believed for which there was no evidence um, on both uh, organisational models of care, primary health care and also um, how, to, how it should be financed. Um, and Collectively, uh, our panel uh, produced 1,223 questions. Uh, that was 744 for organisation and uh, 479 for finance. So we took all these questions, and of course a lot of them were very similar, and we synthesised them, and we managed to reduce them down to 36 questions for organisation and 31 for finance. So then in our second round, this is basically a Delphi panel, it was an anonymous panel, um, we gave them um, those questions and we asked to rate them to rate them for import importance. Uh, and then when we summed the results of all the panelists' responses, um, we then took the top 15 uh, for both those areas. And so in the third round, they got to drag and drop them um, into a ranking for priority. And from this, um, we then got the, uh, the top four prioritised questions in both areas um, the, uh, uh, from our panel. But we did need to know that these were truly knowledge gaps. So we then conducted the literature reviews and we actually did 67 literature reviews um, based on the 67 questions that had come from our panellists. And um, um, obviously, there was a lot of overlap, but we had a, a, a total of 263 studies in low and middle income countries um, uh, uh, for organisation. That was spread throughout the world, uh, the studies. Um, and then there were 113 studies for finance. Uh, and then we created a coding system. You won't be able to read those little boxes, I'm afraid, but um, they're basically primary care dimensions. Um, and we coded all the relevant papers that we found, and we used the software called uh, Epi Reviewer. And this software then generates gap maps. Uh, this is an online um, tool, but this is a static version of it. Um, and um, created this is using our coding matrix. And you can you can see the larger the blue bubble, uh, the more the studies in there. Um, 
but you can see that um, so the studies scattered throughout the chart but you can see that most of this is actually white in other words it's mostly gap and in, on the interactive version um, uh, which is online if you hover over the um, uh, a bubble it will show you uh, all the papers uh, titles in, uh, that, that sit within that bubble make up that bubble and, and then you can click on each one and you can see the abstract as well so it's a very nice little tool to use um, uh, and, and this, this is the one for models of care but the finance one was looked very similar and so this confirmed um, that um, uh, that our on on the ground panelists actually got it right. Um, uh, they knew that there's currently little or no available uh, research answering the, the questions that they really want answered. Uh, to provide plans on how to answer the top four questions for each area, um, we then went back to our panelists and we said, um, uh, "Who is interested and has the ability to?" Um, to write implementation plans to answer these questions. Um, and actually, the you know, part of our grant was that we were supposed to provide implementation plans to, to answer the questions. And there was, a, there was a structure as to how many pages and, uh, and what the budget was and sort of uh, to, to do this. So we produced a template uh, of, of how these plans should be um, uh, written. Uh, and I think I put put out the call to the panel. I think 45 people answered within a week, and then we looked at um, which country um, or which which group, which person would be probably best able to answer uh, one of the questions, um, and um, and and we wanted a range of countries throughout the world. So we ended up with these seven countries. We actually had eight countries, but one of them didn't complete. So there was four questions for finance and four questions for models of care. Uh, and um, basically why we went we wanted to go back to our panelists and they actually provide the, the, the researchers there actually formed teams most of them were, were national teams for their country where they drew people together they had researchers they had clinicians sometimes they had policymakers on their teams they were really uh, well thought out um, um, you know projects that might answer these questions uh, and um, so, yes, but basically why we wanted um, we wanted them uh, to do it this way was that we actually thought it was really important that any research that's done to answer these questions is done with them, by them, but not on them. And so that was sort of part of the co-design approach. Um, at the end of this project, um, the, the funders were planning on... Um, uh, we presented at a conference as part of the project and then they were the, the idea is to form a primary care uh, research consortium uh, which is now just being being formed um, we were hopeful that um, you know our, our our seven teams that have produced these um, these plans might actually get to get some funding to do them but it's uh, it's become a very long and drawn out process and I'm I'm not actually holding a lot of hope that actually they will get funding uh, to do these projects. So um, I, I felt a bit sad about that, that we got them to do this work, uh, but, but it's still, there's still some hope. So I'm, I'm waiting to see what will happen with this international consortium that's, that's just getting started and it's just been provided uh, um, some, some startup money. So um, there are basically um, three different types of, uh, of research co-design. And uh, um, as you can probably imagine, it does take extra time and patience and resources uh, to do research this way. But I also find it incredibly rewarding. And it's much more likely to be, the findings are much more likely to be translated uh, uh, into, into real change. So, um, I'm currently the chair of the Wonka Working Party on research. So in this role, I've edited two books on primary care research, and um, uh, it, it, some of you are likely to have been authors on, on, a, on, a, on a chapter or so in, in one of these two books. Um, and the second one, particularly how to do primary care research, uh, is really a go-to guide on all sorts of different approaches and methodologies, and it's really aimed particularly at, um, at, at early researchers uh, um, in primary care, and, uh, and particularly, of course, in people in developing countries. But um, next year, um, I am co-editing a third book 
uh, which is a practical guide to primary care educational research. So if any of you have expertise in educational research and you are interested in contributing, um, please contact me after the webinar. Um, my email is very easily available. So I guess that's, um, I'm just going to do the technology and get rid of the slideshow. Yeah, I think that should be right. Um, so that's, I probably, um, I think that's, that's it for my talk. So I'm really happy now to take questions. Thank you so much, Felicity. I'd like to perhaps invite you to uh, stop sharing your screen if possible. I thought I did. There we go. You, and, and maybe if people have specific questions about some particular slides, we can go back to it. Let me first um, thank you on behalf of uh, AAA PC and all the attendees for your talk. It was um, was really interesting, always learning new things about about you and about your, your journey and just sort of, you know, learning about how your adventurous and, and traveler spirit and your close sort of connections with the community shaped uh, your journey um, as a clinician initially, but also as a primary care um, academic. So thank you very much for that being so generous. I've got a few questions from the people. So I'm just, um, hopefully when I have a name, I'll, I'll let you know who asked the question. I'd like to begin um, with this question from Sharon James from, I believe the University of Wollongong, asking you about if you published anything on youth chat and if so maybe we can share some of those key um sort of references via our email but yeah what what have you published on that i've probably got about um 20 publications in various aspects of it but it started off as e-chat in fact it started off as chat it was an adult tool and then it became an electronic tool and so youth chat, I've probably only got four or five publications, but I'm, I have a, a list of publications. I can happily share that with. Oh, that would be brilliant. Thank yep. you so much. Um, and thanks for your, catch, your question, Sharon. So the next question, Felicity, is from um, Dr. Liz Sturgis from Monash. So thank you for your talk, Felicity. Great to hear about all this work. Um, Liz wanted to know how you resource community engagement in your projects, both in terms of money, but also in terms of time. The, the the Northland one is um, is an uh, fortunately I've got an HRC grant, a Health Research Council grant. So that actually um, we did build Koha into that and travel and uh, and I have a PhD student doing it. So it's a lot of a lot of it is her time. And then we we actually have on the grant uh, several coll collaborators. They actually paid for their time up north. Uh, but it's a very good question, Liz. Um, the, the, the one in South Auckland has, the, the PHO is kindly supporting the advisory group. We've had no funding for that at all, uh, but we're using, our, um, we're using our students. So on a student, master's student, uh, and Malachi and I uh, do this as part of our, um, you know, part of our jobs. So um, it, it, yeah, it, it, but it, 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 it's, it's challenging and sometimes you have to think quite creatively as to how you can resource things and having that PHO come along and they actually pay them a little stipend every time they come to a meeting. That's, that's an incredible gift. So what I'm hearing as well is all the planning behind it to make it, to make it work basically when you put in grants and just making sure that you're well resourced to, to make sure that these community based projects, um, Sort of will be sustainable throughout the duration of, of the study. So thanks for your question, Liz. Um, the next question is from Anna Fragkudi. Um, so Anna says, hello, Felicity. Thank you for your talk. It sounds really interesting and exciting. I'd like to ask about ethics. So since different legislations apply in different countries, what process did you follow uh, ethics related and what difficulties did you face? Oh, I, I, it's a good question. I actually um, did do a, an international study many years ago where we, had, um, we all had to get our local ethics uh, uh, approvals. And in fact, New Zealand was the most difficult um, uh, and Israel was actually the most easy. We had about five countries. Uh, and it, it made the research very difficult to be able to compare because some of the restrictions we had on ours um, uh, meant that we couldn't have comparable samples in quite the same way. And I actually published a paper on that, on, um, on ethical differences <laughs> uh, between countries. So, but, if you, but with the international research I'm doing now, because I was, um, I was the lead um, 
and uh, and running it out of New Zealand, I only got Auckland ethics approval, uh, New Zealand ethics approval, and that was all we needed for, for that Delphi study. But it, but it, it, it certainly adds another level of complexity if you're actually um, having to get, uh, dealing with lots of different e ethical jurisdictions. Yeah, fascinating question. Thank you so much for that. Some people might actually be interested in that reference that you mentioned about ethics, and I remember reading that. And it's a really good one. So if you don't mind perhaps sharing the reference for that one too, that, that'd be great for the attendees today. Um, the next question is from um, Phyllis Lau. So Phyllis is asking, please, um, to perhaps share your views on Australia's Indigenous health and why, um, you know, maybe um, it is perceived to be lagging behind New Zealand. Oh, it's a good question. I mean, I think both, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Maori health, obviously, there's huge, as you'll know, huge d d disparities between uh, Maori and and um, and Pakeha New Zealanders, and of course in Australia, but it's probably even more so in Australia. I think, um, I think in Australia, it, uh, Maori were much more of a settled people, um, and they basically had one language. Uh, and so even before before the Europeans came, they really weren't a Maori people, they were tribes, but they were able to become one people. Um, uh, whereas in Australia, you have so many indigenous people who, who, who weren't necessarily grounded in one location and with, um, and with a single language. And I think that has made the, um, uh, you know, made addressing the um, disparities just even much more difficult. That, that That's, but a very superficial idea, but that's sort of one of my views on it, really. Yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the, well, that's, that's an interesting one. I think a few people were interested to hear your views um, on, you know, people's criticism of primary healthcare journals having sort of low impact and maybe your advice for primary care researchers. I know that you've talked about the importance of publications and, and you have yourself, you know, published um, it's quite impressive. And so, you know, looking at some of the criticisms of primary healthcare journals, we're quite keen to hear your views on that and maybe how, uh, maybe some advice for some of your colleagues. Well, I mean, I think partly the impact factor of a journal depends on how big the discipline is. And so we, you know, we're not going to be able to compete with cardiology. But you know, Annals of Family Medicine, British Journal and General Practice have pretty respectable impact factors. Uh, and um, and I don't think I don't think we need to just follow impact factors anyway. Um, and the Outmetrics is a very interesting new um, index that actually looks much more at the reach of a journal through social media and 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 uh, and the media. Uh, uh, my view is to always aim high, uh, being prepared to go down and up to down a notch. But I would never publish in a journal that is not indexed, because. It doesn't really matter if you publish in a journal that has a very low impact factor or no impact factor. If it's indexed, people are going to find your work. Uh, and, um, and it may well get uh, some publicity when it's published in your local country. You know, and, um, and, uh, and, and actually, you really have to balance what you want as an academic publishing in a high impact factor journal with actually who, who do you want to read? Who's your audience? And if your audience is primary care, um, uh, you know, practitioners uh, in your country, then I mean, then why not publish in the Journal of Primary Healthcare, which is is going to get to your audience? That that that's. I think you have to balance one thing against another, and I wouldn't be too upset about the, the fact that we don't have high impact fact journals. Just and sometimes, of course, you don't have to publish in a primary care journal. You can you can go lateral. You know. That's really good advice. Uh, really, really good advice um, for some of, some colleagues, some early career and and later down the track kind of people as well. So thank thank you for that, sharing your experience on that. Um, you know, we we do have Felicity, um, some early career researchers uh, attending uh, today, and, I, and I'm one of those. Um, and um, you're mid, you're mid career, Lily. <laughs> I'm sort of driving towards the middle now. Um, <laughs> But uh, be really good to um, sort of have your views and maybe if you have some key advice that you know you'd like to share with um, early career researchers um, wanting to 
you know, sort of um, develop in the field, uh, some perhaps some key things that you've learned and just, um, yeah, advice that you'd like to, to leave us with um, today? Okay, well, I mean, I guess the first thing is to collaborate. Um, and, uh, you know, the more people that are, as long as they're true collaborators and they contribute to a project, the, if everybody is on a publication, everybody gets a publication. So it actually increases the, the, the wealth. Um, so definitely collaborate. Um, think, you know, go laterally in terms of uh, who you might work with on a project. Uh, uh, take on, um, if you can, um, summer student or, or master student or honours student, it increases your networks. So grow your networks because your networks come back and provide you with all sorts of resources in amazing ways. So networking is really important. Um, publish everything. If your study doesn't, if it's a negative study, it didn't work out the way you wanted, that's a really important message to actually um, put out there. Uh, and you need to sell your sell your study and why it should be published to the, to the editor when you write a covering letter. Uh, but you know, that means somebody else won't have to go down that path and actually learn that it doesn't work. You know? So uh, they're probably the main things. Um, you pub publish your mistakes as well as your successes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and review. Um, reviewing is a really good way to improve your, um, uh, your, uh, your writing skills. Uh, because you see, and your, your research methodology skills, because you see, you can see the mistakes in other people's work. Uh, review kindly, but but critically. Uh, and um, and also be aware that um, for every paper you publish, you probably should review one, because this is a voluntary thing that we do as, um, as part of an academic community, that we review each other's work. So reviewing papers, but reviewing uh, other sorts of material, research proposals, whatever. Um, get involved in those sort of activities and it'll actually help grow you as an academic. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Felicity. It is, it is so inspiring to um, listen to you and to th that level of commitment, um, you know, with, with the community and with primary care community as well um, is, is, is truly, is truly inspiring. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for having been so generous, generous with us um, today. Um, I'd like to um, also thank all our attendees. So we had um, 20, 19 um, people uh, attending today. This is very exciting. Um, everybody who, you know, nobody sort of left early or anything. I think you kept us, uh, you know, sort of really captivated throughout your presentation. So big thank you to Felicity, to our attendees. Thank you for sharing questions. I'd like to invite you to also um, sort of email APC. Maybe you'd like to hear from a particular speaker or you'd like to have presentations on particular topics please contact APC. Um, we're always open to any suggestions. We're actually currently planning next year's webinar, so uh, please do share your, um, your ideas uh, with us. Um, a big thank you to Phyllis Lau, Acting President of APC, who's been doing a lot of work behind the scenes today, collating your questions. Um, it's, it's been great, and thank you to, to, to APC and, and my colleagues for that. So I wish you all a very great day, and thanks for attending again, and we'll be uh, seeing you uh, all next year for our next webinar. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lauren. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>